Right, so next up is Benjamin from, uh, from Dropbox, and he'll talk about test selection. Greetings, salutations, hi. Uh, it's great to see you, all of you here this afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, it seems like we find ourselves back in Sunnyvale. Uh, Sunnyvale, of course, is uh, America's corporate campus capital. Uh, with representatives from uh, all of the nation's most ethically tainted industries. Uh, but despite the uh, sense of anomie uh, and white collar alienation uh, pervading the place, uh, this venue is quite an upgrade uh, for, for BaselCon. Uh, you know, maybe it's a, a reflection of our rising status as a community. Maybe once you do 1.0, you get to use the grown up conference center. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, I will say that uh, if this is your first BaselCon, uh, you missed the experience of attending a conference held in a shoebox. Uh, I know a whole lot less this year about how my fellow uh, Basel enthusiasts smell. Uh, so uh, I hide Benjamin. Uh, my name is Benjamin. Uh, and I put food on the table uh, these days by working for a company called Dropbox. Uh, uh, specifically, I work on uh, Dropbox's development infrastructure team. Uh, and we're responsible for all the tools, continuous integration, uh, build stuff uh, that Dropbox engineers use to get their job done. Uh, and we've been using Bazel for uh, quite a while now, about four years since it was uh, originally uh, became open source. Uh, I would say that we'd been using it before it was cool, uh, except I think that uh, still today build systems occupy a level of glamour and, and cultural cachet that uh, is somewhere between like dentures and, and latex gloves. So I, I, won't, I won't make that claim. Uh, <laughs> So, but anyway, we've had over the years uh, the opportunity to accumulate uh, a lot of uh, successes and uh, titanic failures uh, building tooling around Bazel. Uh, and we've talked about it uh, the last two Bazel cons. Uh, so we talked about generating build files. Uh, we talked about integration testing uh, with Bazel. Uh, so I Go look up those if you want to hear about those topics. Uh, and we also, uh, just yesterday, uh, we released a bunch of our Bazel related tooling uh, on GitHub. Uh, so the URL is right there. Uh, you can go and find it. Uh, so this is our build file generator, uh, our integration testing framework, uh, and also our Python roles. Uh, so uh, we can probably do something uh, for your, your Python problems uh, if, if you are willing to do things our way. Uh, but that's uh, not, not really the topic of this uh, talk. Uh, we also uh, put up a blog post today uh, on our uh, tech blog um, about how we integrate Bazel uh, in our CI system. Uh, if it has a long URL, which I didn't bother to put up there, uh, but if you go, I'm sure you'll be able to find it uh, if you stick uh, Dropbox tech blob uh, in DuckDuckGo. I mean Google. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, uh, so we like Bazel uh, because of its scalability, uh, its focus on hermeticity uh, and reproducibility, uh, and because it tastes great on uh, pasta and pizza. Uh, but I have a more personal reason uh, for uh, really liking Bazel, uh, and that is that it contains my favorite Java method definition ever. Right, right, so, so, uh, so, 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 so verbosity is, is the standard in Java naming, of course, right? Uh, but in, in this case, the, the verbosity kind of obfuscates uh, more, than, more than enlightens. Uh, and so there's 10 words in this method name. Uh, five of them are unique. The word four, two appears four times. Uh, and after uh, thinking a long time, doing a lot of nail biting, uh, consulting with top, top linguistics experts, I've come to the conclusion that the way you should segment this method name uh, is convert library to link list to library to link list. Now, that's still a little confusing, right? Because if you ignore the fact that the argument to this function is a set rather than a list, uh, it still seems like this function should not be doing anything, right? But everything becomes clear uh, if you notice that there's actually two classes called library to link, right? There's the library to link package level class and the nested class of linker inputs. All right. so. Uh, this, is, this brings a smile uh, to my uh, face every time I do a build, uh, and you can think about what's inside next time you're running a build, too. Uh, and I, I, I could probably give a whole talk about the hidden gems of, of Bazel, uh, but unfortunately, that is not this top, 
uh, and we were best getting back to the uh, actual topic of, of this talk. Um, and uh, to do that, I'd like to introduce uh, kind of the framing story, an overall problem uh, for this talk. Uh, there's a lot of problems in this talk, as you'll see. Uh, and that is what I'm going to call the selection problem. Uh, and here are the contours of that problem. Uh, so I run a continuous, in, in, continuous integration system. Uh, and I, uh, Dropbox has millions of lines of code uh, and thousands of primates uh, making changes to this code. Uh, sometimes they even write tests. Uh, and so uh, the, the continuous integration system is exposed to uh, these proposed changes in several forms. Uh, so pre-review uh, pre uh, testing, uh, code, tests on code reviews, pre-submit tests, uh, and tests after uh, a change has actually landed. Uh, and every time uh, the CI system sees a test, it uh, has to decide what tests to run. Uh, and in particular, uh, we want to run the tests which are uh, most useful uh, for um, engineers to uh, be seeing the results for, for a particular change. Uh, and one kind of logically obvious thing uh, is that we should only run tests uh, that can possibly be affected uh, by a change. Uh, and so kind of in Bazel terminology, that means we should only be running tests uh, that have a transitive dependency on files that were modified uh, in a particular change. So this talk is going to be focusing on testing, uh, but this idea of uh, selecting targets, computing the targets which are affected by a particular change, uh, has other uses too. Uh, for example, you can do things like only deploy uh, binaries uh, which have actually changed uh, over a series of commits uh, and generate custom change logs um, from an overall change log for just the changes that affected a particular target. All right, uh, so if we first see this problem, we might think, well, what's the problem? Why don't we just do this? Uh, you know, uh, run Bazel test over our entire workspace. Uh, and as, as we've seen several times uh, before in this conference, uh, and as you probably know as a Bazel user, uh, Bazel will. Uh, not run the tests uh, which, don't, which it doesn't think um, need to be run uh, and sort of like print cached uh, in the test results if it didn't run them. Uh, and so uh, this solution uh, has the, uh, the advantage that uh, it looks pretty simple on the surface. Uh, we don't have to build anything extra. Uh, and since we're using Bazel's uh, built-in uh, invalidation uh, and caching logic, uh, should be about as correct as Bazel, which is, which is a generally a pretty high standard. Uh, but on the other hand, um, this, uh, this solution, uh, Bazel test slash slash dot dot dot, uh, has some serious scalability concerns. Uh, for example, uh, we almost certainly are going to need to have a remote execution for this to continue to scale uh, because uh, large changes uh, or changes to particularly common dependencies will trigger a lot of tests, uh, which won't be reasonable to run in a reasonable amount of time uh, on one machine. Um, this also still continues to do a lot of work kind of up to uh, actually executing uh, the actions in Bazel. So uh, this does analysis, computes the command lines for everything, uh, and that itself can take a lot of memory and a lot of CPU. Uh, so on a workspace of sufficient size, this is not really a reasonable thing to doing. And then finally, uh, this doesn't really give us everything we want. So it's a little inflexible. Uh, we might want to be able to apply custom policies to the kinds of tests we're running in our repository. Uh, for example, maybe there are some really expensive tests that we only want to run uh, every a few hours or every day or something. Uh, but Bazel doesn't really give us the controls to do things like that uh, just using Bazel test. And finally, we don't actually manage to produce uh, an affected set of uh, targets um, from doing this. Uh, Bazel just kind of executes what it thinks it needs to be executed uh, and doesn't tell us um, what the true affected set was. Uh, so uh, we need to do a little better. Uh, but first, let's define uh, our problem a little more closely. Uh, so the input to the uh, selection problem uh, is a set of uh, change source files. Uh, so we can also think of this as being uh, two uh, revisions of a version control system uh, where we're looking at the, the changes between those two revisions. Uh, these are equivalent ways of thinking about uh, this particular input, uh, and we'll be switching between them uh, because sometimes it's convenient to think of it in one form or another. Uh, and then we also have uh, a universe of targets uh, that we're going to be searching for uh, the affected targets within. Uh, so in our, this talk uh, and our examples, we'll always be using the entire workspace, slash, slash, dot, dot, dot. Uh, but uh, there's certainly use cases uh, for a more restricted uh, scope. <laughs> 
Okay, and so our algorithm, our solution to the selection problem, uh, is supposed to produce a subset of the universe uh, that is possibly affected by those changes. So we're always going to have to be a little conservative. Uh, we can't always prove uh, that a, a, a test is definitely affected by a particular change, uh, but we want to be uh, conservatively include all the tests that might be affected. All right, uh, let me also show you uh, the controlling example uh, for my change here. All right, so we're going to be considering a little uh, package called slash slash foo. Uh, and here's the build file for slash slash foo. All right, so I have a library, a C++ library, with a single source, lib.cc. Uh, and then there's a test called my test, uh, which depends on the library. Uh, and you'll also see at the top uh, there is a uh, dependency on a Starlock file called myrule.bzl. Uh, so this is kind of a, a very silly uh, dependency. Uh, it's a, it's, the whole thing is a bit contrived. Um, but it'll work for our example purposes. Uh, and if you want to see a non-trivial build file, uh, we're hiring. <laughs> All right, so uh, with the example in hand, uh, we can start to think about how we're actually going to uh, pick out the targets uh, that are affected by a change. Uh, and this means we're going to be uh, looking at the Bazel dependency graph. And the tool to do that, of course, uh, is Bazel query. Uh, so Bazel query uh, lets us do uh, post-loading uh, inspection of the dependency graph. So that's a little bit of Bazel jargon uh, loading. That essentially means that uh, the build files have been executed from top to bottom, uh, but rules haven't been instantiated. Um, so uh, targets are basically a name uh, with a bunch of attributes attached to them, like sources uh, and depths uh, and so forth. Uh, and Bazel query lets us uh, manipulate uh, this graph. Uh, it's a very extensive tool uh, with uh, extensive documentation. Uh, there's a good reference. Uh, you can also see the Bazel query how-to document, which has a lot of neat examples about things you can do uh, with, ba with Bazel query. Uh, but like any sufficiently powerful tool, uh, it has some, some uh, complexities and gotchas which can, uh, which can cop up if you're trying to do some uh, serious production things uh, with Bazel query. So for example, uh, there's that I'm aware of three different internal implementations of query. Um, two of them are even documented. Um, and this is the kind of thing that's going to come up uh, when you're doing like large uh, performance sensitive uh, 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 queries. So uh, if, if there's one sub theme of this talk is that you should, you should uh, treat, treat Bazel query with a little reverence and, and maybe a little fear. Uh, so uh, anyway, if we go and look at the Bazel query reference documentation, uh, we'll quickly uh, find uh, some functions uh, which will probably be helpful to us uh, in uh, figuring out uh, what targets are affected uh, given a set of changed files. Uh, so the first uh, is the test function. So the test function takes a bunch of targets uh, and it throws out all the targets that aren't tests. Uh, so we'll use this as a kind of final filtering phase uh, in our algorithm to only pick out the test targets because that's what we're interested in running. Uh, and then the real workhorse is going to be the rdeps function. Uh, so the rdeps function uh, computes the worst dependencies of a set of targets uh, within a particular universe. Uh, so uh, with these two, it doesn't take much imagination to see that we probably want to do something uh, like this. OK, so uh, we feed the change files into the rdeps function. Uh, we want to compute it over the entire universe. So that gives us all the rdeps uh, transitively of those change files. Um, and then uh, we pick out the test. Uh, so if we run this on our really silly uh, foo example, uh, we'll see that uh, indeed, uh, if we suppose that our uh, uh, my libcc um, source file was changed, uh, then we'll see that we should be running uh, foo foo slash slash foo my test. Great, right? Uh, are we done? Uh, well, if we were done, this would have been a lightning talk. Um, there's a few problems, and uh, many of them uh, center around uh, the, asking the question like, well, what if we mutate the build graph uh, instead of source files? Uh, so. Here's the first of three problems. What if we what if we modify a build file? Okay, so if we put a if we put a build file into our rdeps expression here, uh, Bazel will just say nope, nothing depends on that. Uh, and to some degree, that's true, right? My test does not actually depend on the build file to execute, but modifying the build file could certainly uh, affect the test. Uh, so we're going to need something to, to, deal, to, deal with, to deal with build files. Uh, but uh, happily, uh, if we go back to the uh, Bazel query reference documentation, we can find out some more uh, functions which might help us 
uh, with that. Uh, so specifically the siblings function. So the siblings function uh, takes in a target and it returns all the targets which are in the same package uh, as a uh, uh, the target, the input target. Uh, so this function is useful for computing all the targets uh, in a build file. Uh, and then we also have the filter function, uh, which filters targets uh, by applying a regular expression uh, to their name. Uh, so with this, uh, we can, uh, f look, given our set of changed files, we can filter out all the build files, uh, and then we can compute all the targets that are in those build files. So um, we might, we, we, there's this little subtle question, which is like, what targets do we actually need to mark affected if a build file is modified, right? So if all we know is a build file is modified, arbitrary things could have happened to the targets within it. So we basically have to run all the targets uh, in that build file and all the targets which uh, have a transitive risk dependency on that build file. Uh, but uh, using these tools, we can kind of uh, integrate uh, our original RDEPS query uh, and um, uh, this fix for the build file thing. Uh, so I'm making use of Bazel query syntax to let you define a variable uh, to store my changed files. Uh, and then I have the RDEPS over the changed files, and then also all of the targets in build files that were modified. Uh, and then again, uh, prints foo test if changed files is, is, is slash of build. All right, so that fixes that problem. Uh, but we had three problems, so uh, let's look at problem number two. Uh, so another way you can modify the build graph uh, is by changing a Starlark file. All right, uh, and if we tried the original RDEPS query, uh, the result is even more horrific um, than the, uh, the build file case. Uh, Basil's gonna, Basil is gonna tell us, uh, you know, I've never heard of this, this myrule.bzl file. Uh, what are you talking about? Uh, and it's also gonna give us some hint about maybe you wanna put export files uh, in your build file. Uh, so we can go and put uh, export files in our build file, uh, but that's really not gonna help us very much and kind of just stick us back at the, uh, the, the situation, the build file. Uh, it's, it's a red herring. Um, and this problem is also fixable, uh, but we need to do some more learning. Uh, specifically, we need to learn about something called SkyQuery. Uh, so SkyQuery is one of those other uh, query implementations. Uh, so the generic query implementation of Bazel uh, works by kind of using Bazel's build file parser and loader uh, to load all the targets, uh, and then it copies all of those target graph information into a separate graph uh, and does the query over that. So that makes it very flexible because it's a very uh, generic graph implementation. Uh, but it also means there's this overhead involved in, in copying um, targets into the other graph. Uh, SkyQuery, on the other hand, uh, uses Bazel's um, uh, native uh, incrementality uh, loading framework directly uh, to implement query. Uh, and we, for that, we get slightly different uh, performance characteristics. Uh, so there's less copying, and it might, be, it might be a little more performant, especially with really large universal queries like what we're doing here. Uh, but we also get a slightly different feature set uh, with SkyQuery. Uh, in particular, uh, we can't ask for our output to be ordered in any particular way. So to activate SkyQuery, we have to pass dash dash order output equals no. Um, and so that's okay for the selected target, the target selection case, because um, we don't really care what output, what order we get it in. We just want all of the targets. Uh, and then we also have to use a uh, option called dash dash universe scope, um, and that's going to be the total universe that we're allowed to access uh, within the query. So we're going to be t we're going to be passing slash slash dot 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 in there. Anyway, the main advantage we get from getting SkyQuery, at least in this case, uh, is that we get another function called our build files. Uh, and our build files uh, takes a path, for example, a Starlark file, and tells us all the build files that transitively depend uh, on that, uh, that uh, path. All right, so uh, our first attempt to use this uh, actually might fail like this. All right, so we're using our build files and we're passing in our, our Starlark file, uh, but we're still getting empty results. Uh, does this thing not work as advertised? Well, actually, <laughs> If you go carefully read the documentation, you'll see that our build files, unlike every other Bazel query function, does not take targets, it takes path fragments. So we have to go past a path, not a target. And if we do that, we'll finally find out that foo slash build depends on that Starlark file, great. Okay, 
So now that we've found all the build files that depend on a Starlark file, we can apply the same logic where we uh, get all the targets in those build files and then, and then mark all the targets there and all their reverse dependencies uh, um, as affected. Uh, so um, great, like we can go and we'll be using the siblings function, right? So that, that, should, that, should, that, that should still work. Uh, I won't show you the combined query. Uh, let's look at uh, the next problem. Um, and at this point, I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to announce that my problem counter works like the basal action counter. <laughs> and yes, 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 we're, we're, we're up to five in the denominator. Who knows how high it will go? Uh, and, but anyway, problem three, problem three has to do with, well, what if instead of modifying a file, we deleted a file? All right, so uh, if we ask for the reverse dependency of a deleted file, uh, Bazel quite reasonably is going to tell us, I don't know about this, it doesn't exist. Um, but, a but removing a file could still modify the build graph. Uh, for example, if there was a glob somewhere uh, that has stopped picking up this uh, this file, uh, so we need to do something about this. And the something that we have to do uh, is we have to um, go back to the old version where this file, de this deleted file exists, compute the affected targets of the deleted file, and then bring those forward into uh, the new universe uh, and intersect it with all the targets that exist in the new version. Okay, so we're gonna have to run at least two queries now. Um, let's uh, jump on to problem four. Um, which also has to do uh, with adding or deleting files, but this time build files. Uh, so, and it, it revolves around a problem with the glob function. So the glob function, uh, which lets you pick up lots of files in build files, uh, can be used recursively, but it cannot cross package boundaries. So a recursive glob will pick up files in directories until it hits another build file and then it will go no further. This means that if you add or remove a package, you can affect the globs of uh, its parent packages. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is another problem where we have to figure out uh, what the, the files which are uh, affected by this are and kind of invalidate all the targets uh, in those uh, files. Um, and so this is a particularly annoying because we can't really do it in the context of query. Uh, we kind of have to manually traverse the file system and find out uh, packages which had sub-packages added or deleted. But uh, this problem is fixable, and then eventually uh, we'll end up with something great like this. You know, this is our universal reverse depth computing query. Uh, so you can see we have all of our fixes. We have the reverse steps of the, the change files. Uh, we deal with the build files. We deal with the Starlock files. And then we deal with, um, with the uh, build files with added or removed sub packages. Uh, you'll see I have to filter out the paths um, by, by extension. Uh, and I did that by ensuring some horrible shell. That's because I don't have to maintain slide code. Um, and then finally, we have another tar a query which we had to run previously and insert into this one, which is the affected targets of deleted files from the older vision. All right, so uh, this plugs most of the holes, uh, but you know we might have to. S this this is far cry from our, our our original intention here, where it seems so nice and easy with our our, our one R depth function and one test function. Uh, and and if this actually works, you know we've certainly you know our quest for elegance has certainly taken a cold shower. Uh, and since that's really what matters in software engineering, uh, I, don't, I don't want to do this. So let's take a step back and reconsider. All right, uh, so thinking about this again, uh, at the beginning I said that a, a target is uh, approximately, at loading phase, a name uh, with some attributes. Uh, and there's actually a way to get um, Bazel uh, to tell you what the attributes are. Uh, so, so far we've been using query in a mode where it only outputs the names of targets. Uh, but query is quite capable of telling us basically everything there is to know about a particular target. Uh, in particular, uh, if we pass dash dash output equals proto, uh, Bazel will emit a giant proto uh, for all the targets which are the output of uh, the rule. So uh, here's an example uh, from my foo package. Uh, so you can see uh, there's a target um, message. Uh, it tells us what type it is. It's a rule. Uh, it tells us what its rule class is. Uh, and then each attribute has a protobuf, uh, which tells us what its type is, its name, and its value. Uh, 
And then finally at the end, uh, we have some rule input uh, uh, attributes. Uh, and this tells us what um, rules this particular target depends on. Uh, so thinking about this a little, uh, and also um, thinking about cryptography, we can go back and appropriate an old idea uh, from, from cryptography. Uh, so old is important uh, because uh, that means a patent has expired. Um, uh, and that old idea is the miracle tree. So uh, what I want to do is construct, take my target dependency graph um, and associate a hash to each node uh, such that uh, the hash depends on the attributes of that uh, target and also all of its transitive dependencies. Uh, and using that, I can tell whether a particular target uh, has changed or not. Uh, so the way that works is that at the bottom of our dependency graph, we usually have a lot of source files. Uh, so for example, lib.cc. Uh, so we could just say that the, the, the hash of that node is the hash of the contents of the file. Uh, and then moving up a level, we have our lib rule, uh, which actually contains the source file. Uh, and so the hash of that will be the hash of all of its attributes, for example, the cops, uh, plus the hash uh, of the, uh, uh, its source file, uh, lib.cc. And finally, at the top, uh, our test uh, has its own attributes, uh, and it depends on my lib. Uh, so we hash all those things and get a final hash. All right, so uh, perhaps it's a little easier to see this in code. Um, to hash a target, uh, we just go through all of its attributes. Um, sort of, we can we can just hash the attributes by ser re-serializing the the attribute protobuf uh, or message, uh, and then we uh, recursively call hash target uh, to hash all of the rule inputs. All right, so this this simplifies a little because there's more things on the rule protobuf that we need, uh, but it's largely largely the the idea. And then using this information, uh, we can write a little code to actually compute targets that are changed. Uh, so uh, we're going to need as inputs all the targets in the old revision and all the targets in the new revision. Uh, so we compute a uh, map from the target name to its hash for both the old revision and the new revision. Uh, and then for all of the targets in the new revision, uh, first we check whether that target exists in the old revision or not. If it doesn't exist at all, then it's new, so we definitely need to run it. It's definitely affected. Uh, so we'll add it to our affected set. And then otherwise, uh, if the affected, the, the hash of the target in the new revision differs from that in the old revision, uh, we'll add it to our affected set. Uh, and kind of on a uh, macro, uh, operational level, this is what just this looks out looks like. If say if we were using Git, so we output, we check out uh, the old uh, revision, uh, and then we run this query, uh, which is pretty simple uh, to sort of dump the entire Bazel uh, dependency target graph as a proto. Uh, we save that. We check out the new revision. Uh, we run the same query, uh, and that produces a giant proto file. Uh, and then we run our code, uh, select targets, uh, passing in the uh, the old graph and the new graph uh, and the, the files we think are changed. Uh, and then that runs the code up from the previous slide, uh, which finally tells us that foo, uh, my test has been modified. Okay, so on one hand, uh, we've, we've kind of given up on using query. Uh, we've sort of reduced Bazel to like a glorified incremental build file proto dumper parser thing. Um, but and we had to write some code of our own, which is never good. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's, it, once you get your idea around the, the build miracle tree, your head around the idea of the build miracle tree, uh, it's pretty conceptually easy to understand. Uh, and it's much easier to believe that this is correct rather than the, the, horror, the monstrous uh, query I was showing you, showing you before. Uh, but there's still another problem. Uh, and that has to do with external workspaces. Um, and the root of this problem is that query cannot really tell you uh, what files uh, are affected in an external workspace. Uh, so like if I go look at an example, right? So if I have this HTTP archive file in my, or rule in my workspace file, uh, then that defines a external repository at awesome third party software. Um, and if, if someone goes and modifies this URL, that will probably cause uh, corresponding changes in the source files of the uh, 
external workspace. But query just has no way to tell us that, to match up the change in the workspace file uh, to that in the external repository. Um, and partially, uh, that's just because it, that's a truly impossible task. So um, this is a very tame external workspace, uh, but it's very easy to have an external workspace that causes arbitrary code to execute, reads arbitrary things from the system, uh, to makes network calls, and is just basically flagrantly non-hermetic. And in that case, it's, impo it's essentially impossible to compute the inputs uh, to a workspace rule, or whether it changed or not, because the inputs are the world. Um, so we can, we can partially address this problem, at least for a restricted set of a workspace rules, uh, by using the disgusting hack. Uh, and so Bazel does not expose this information at all, but Bazel itself kind of has this problem where it needs to know whether to refetch a repository or not. Um, and so it kind of stores a, ha a hash of what it thinks are the inputs to the repository uh, in a special place in its internal output tree. Uh, so you also can go and slurp up these hashes, uh, and then if they change, you know the repository changed. Uh, so uh, it's, 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 it's gross, but, but, but effective. Uh, so that, that plugs the external workspace rule. All right, with, with that behind us, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the optimization of target selection. So uh, this is a very critical piece of a continuous integration pipeline, uh, selecting a test to run. Uh, for one, it runs on every single uh, time someone wants to use the, the continuous integration system. And also, it's kind of in the critical path. It blocks uh, actually executing the tests uh, because we don't know what they are yet. Um, and so uh, we spent some time making this faster. And probably the most important thing we did uh, was we made uh, Bazel query into a service. Uh, so uh, every time we were previously executing Bazel, uh, kind of like a shell command, uh, we instead make an RPC. And the Bazel query service uh, encapsulates uh, the idea of uh, checking out a revision um, of our, a particular revision of our version control system, executing a query, and then uploading the results uh, to a persistent storage uh, so that uh, the client can actually access those results. So uh, we have to use a kind of large file storage thing because these, these Outputs can be in the, the hundreds of megabytes easily. All right, um, so why is this better? Well, uh, one reason is that the Bazel query service can kind of maintain a farm of uh, hot um, Bazel uh, servers. And so that means uh, Bazel's incrementality logic uh, can avoid doing unnecessary work. Uh, it kind of has hot state of um, files that it's parsed. Um, and also the, uh, the JVM stays warm. Um, another advantage uh, is that uh, we can cache queries. Uh, so if you get uh, the, s the same uh, request for a query on the same revision uh, twice, uh, you should be able to only compute that once. Uh, and then probably the biggest advantage is that we can execute queries in parallel. Uh, so uh, you saw we have to have, there's fundamentally we have to have two queries. We have to have a query on the old revision and a query on a new revision. Uh, so, um, with a query service, we can just submit two queries at the same time uh, and kind of get the results back in about half the time, which is a, a very major improvement because query uh, is kind of the slowest part of this operation. All right, uh, so you might reasonably wonder uh, what it's like to operate uh, the Bazel query service. Uh, it's kind of a weird service where it's, it's, it's I would say, quasi-stateful. So the, the, kind of the entire point of it is to have some maintained state, uh, have warm Bazel servers uh, and caches and so forth. Um, but also, you know, if the cluster management software comes along and says, this machine needs to go away, it's not too much, too much of a loss to, to uh, remove that Bazel query system because it's all re-replicatable by starting up uh, new Bazels on uh, the workspace. Um, but another special property of Bazel Query Service uh, is that because queries execute for so long, like minutes is not a, an unheard of uh, time period, uh, we need to have a special kind of front end for the Bazel Query Service uh, that takes care of uh, keeping track of which workers are busy executing queries uh, and routes queries to the uh, correct back end, which is free. And so Bazel is actually not, not too difficult to manage uh, in this situation we've found, and kind of the most difficult thing actually has been Git. So Git just, it seems like if you like execute it too many times on a repository or like gets uncleanly shut down at some point, it just like gives up and, and, and corrupts your repo or something. 
Um, and so kind of a lot of the work of the stability, making the system st stable uh, has been just like parsing get error messages to decide whether it's like completely broken or not and we need to blow away the repo. And so that's one of the more disappointing learnings uh, from, from, the, from this whole affair. Like, I'm not sure if this is because Git is just wrong or because it's just impossible to write data preserving systems on Linux file systems, uh, but e either way we can blame the same person, right? So. <laughs> okay, uh, finally, uh, I would like to touch on uh, what I'm calling being incorrect for profit. Um, and this, this, this revolves uh, around uh, the fact that uh, only running affected tests uh, only gets you so far. Uh, for one thing, it's very much a, uh, a uh, depends on the structure of your dependency graph, right? So if you have many fine uh, dependencies, uh, you're much more likely to select out a lot of tests. Uh, if, uh, for example, uh, you have one giant um, monolithic web app where everything is an integration test that depends on everything, hypothetically, uh, you might not uh, win quite as much. Um, but even with uh, affected, uh, only running affected tests, it kind of seems like you only cut out of like a say, on average, a constant factor uh, of the number of tests you're gonna run. Uh, and there seems to be a sad fact that uh, test execution time uh, in CI systems grows quadratically. Um, and the two quadratic factors are the number of changes uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the amount of code. Um, and like quadratic growth is, no one wants to wait for quadratic growth uh, for their tests to run. Uh, and most importantly, companies don't want to pay for quadratic growth in testing resources. Um, so this is not really uh, an acceptable situation to be in. Uh, so we need to apply some even more aggressive strategies to prune the tests uh, that we're running. Uh, and there's uh, several ways of going about this. Um, one is batching. Uh, so that's where you take a whole bunch of test changes uh, and then you compute the affected test set over all of them and run the test once. So that way uh, you, don't, you only run a test at least once for all these changes. Uh, it does have the complexity that there's, it kind of extends the tail of getting test results for changes in the middle. Uh, it also means you want to have some sort of automatic bisection system to find out if tests were broken uh, in between. Uh, but it can uh, dramatically reduce, reduce the number of test executions, uh, which are largely duplicate uh, that you have to do. Uh, you can also apply policies uh, uh, which bound selection. So you can say things like, well, we're only going to run tests uh, which are four hops in the dependency graph away from uh, the, a file that was changed. Uh, and the goal here is to uh, hopefully tests which are closer to the code being changed are more likely to actually find, find problems with it. And finally, if you want to be uh, really clever, um, uh, and modern, uh, you can do predictive testing, where you try to guess uh, what tests are most likely to fail. Uh, so usually do this with statistics uh, or other kinds of, of, of machine learning. Uh, Google and Facebook have published some interesting papers about this. All right, uh, so with that in the bag, I'm, I'm largely done. Here's an image credit for uh, my first slide. Um, and I'll turn it over to you uh, if you have any questions. Uh, this, of course, is my email address. Uh, you, can reach, you can reach me there um, until such a time that e one entity on either side of the at sign decides to call it quits. Um, and uh, f please do check out um, our other talks and our open source uh, Bazel tools uh, on GitHub. Thanks. Right, so talking about hidden gems, I think Benjamin talked the hidden gem on every BaselCon so far. So, and I'm also looking forward to an actual talk about hidden gems in Basel code base. <laughs> uh, and with that, are there any questions? Hi, yeah, uh, Itai. I have, uh, have two questions. One is, um, what, what's the order of magnitude, like how much time does this take? How much time does a commit need to wait, a build request needs to wait? So I, think, so I think this is completely proportional to the size of your, your workspace. So I think we're at about uh, uh, two minutes mm -hmm. to, to do this selection. Is that right? Yeah, two minutes. And uh, did you consider uh, preemptively running the Bazel query, you know, based on basically get, get events so that when the build request comes, then maybe you've already computed the, the Bazel query? Well, I mean, there's... Our, 
it's not really preemptive because our CI system is triggered off Git pushes. Oh, okay. So there's like, we, there's nothing, there's, there's not no really any there. guessing to be done in our okay. case anyway. Okay, and actually a third question. Did you consider uh, having a, the, basically an in, in memory the, the graph instead of running Bazel query? Uh, so, I mean, well, you would still need some way to update that, right? And you would, and like, you need Bazel because Bazel is the only thing that's capable of doing the like somewhat complex work of parsing build files and like turning that into targets, right? So I, Bazel is the one that has the in memory graph, and you know probably if we if we wanted to be clever, we would actually just like hack up the Bazel code base to do this selection incrementally for us. Like that would be the next performance frontier because there's this whole point like, why are we like serializing this into protobuf so we can put it in memory in another program and like hash it? Like something is a little silly here. Uh, but uh, I think. That's another scaling boundary, I think, which we will we'll yeah, eventually. Because rumor has it that at least some companies uh, have, have in memory graphs of a Bazel graph. And you know, <laughs> one can think that maybe the community would also benefit from having. Uh, I see, I see, I see you're, you're like me this morning. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, 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 yeah? I, I can't help you with Google, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Tran from Neuro, and uh, I have uh, two questions. First is, uh, if uh, we change the action of uh, some uh, rule, which is like from implement by BZL file, would that be captured by a hash? Uh, an input? Not input, like uh, the, the action. Like I can change the BZL file and say what's the action execution rule. Well, oh, oh so the Starlark file, yes. Yeah. So that's actually a good question, which was something I, I alighted for simplicity. Um, which is that uh, Bazel sticks an extra magical attribute on every target, which is called the rule implementation hash, uh, which is a hash of all the uh, code that went into computing, goes into computing that rule. So if you just stick that attribute uh, into your overall target hash, then that takes care of that. Oh, great. And the second question is, is it like uh, the hashing or like uh, other two, like uh, is any open source? Uh, uh, so it's ours. Ours is not uh, open source uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, we pro we, we it doesn't have too many dependencies. Uh, we can think about it. I <laughs> All right, thank you. Ah, uh, tradition. Hey, hey, I both. <laughs> I I work for Google. Um, I was wondering if you're using the right query options because the ones on the slides were not the right query options. <laughs> <laughs> I I also I also lighted some stuff for that's not exactly what we're running, but but I, I, I what what are the right query options? I, I did a little bit of work on query performance earlier this year. Um, you know what's funny if you advance my slide by one <laughs> <laughs> and show it. <laughs> It'll probably be about what Ulf is going to tell us about, but maybe he's better. It's graphless okay. query? There is graphless query. Something uh, else? Yes. What is that? Um, well, you should also use auto output equals no uh, in all cases. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and the third is uh, stream proto. Ah, uh, yes, 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 I, yes, I, yes, I, <laughs> yes, I meant to start using that, but I didn't, I didn't. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good point, though. Yeah. So, so just for, for everyone else here, graphless query avoids making a copy. That, that's what it says here. Um, and the, the advantage of using stream proto is that it doesn't construct a single giant proto in memory. Right? You get a problem when you get to like two gigabyte protos, because then the int isn't large enough to address the entire proto. And then it'll fail with an out of memory error, because it can't allocate an array that's large enough. Anyway, thanks. The, the stream yeah. proto is a very, very good hint. It's obvious that at least the documentation and, at, and definitely the set of flags we have need some improvement here. So that's, that's obvious. Of course, yeah. Hello, I'm John from Stripe. Uh, two questions. First, would it be correct to say that this is a mitigation for lack of remote test execution? Uh, no, because, because as, as I, I was trying to say this at the beginning, but if we, we, we never want to run Bazel tests slash slash dot dot dot, because that does, already does a huge amount of work on every target in the, in the so basically like all the work up to actually executing it. Um, and so like we want, we want to be able to cut out, eliminate tests like at the 
many levels, but like sort of the, wor the level where we have to do the least amount of work on it. Um, and so we don't, we don't want to analyze all rules. Um, we just want, we want to be able to prove that they can't be affected uh, sort of as quickly and, and is with the least amount of resources uh, as, as, as possible. And uh, another strategy I've seen used with some success is having sort of metadata files at different levels of the source file system where you say, anything under this directory needs to run these tests. And then if you make changes outside of that directory, you may not necessarily need to add that test to your test set. Well, that sounds uh, like a workaround for something else. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let him answer uh, that comment. <laughs> right. Thanks, Benjamin.